How are you? I'm good. We're a bit early. Let's give give a good two minutes for so people can actually come. What do we think of the lighting? Well, it could be lighter. <laughs> do you have any, <laughs> Do you have any sunlight coming anywhere? No, it's horrible. It's all gray today. Oh. No. oh. Yeah, it's terrible. I tried. Hello, it's Ariana. It's funny light. Yeah, because for me, it's like, I'm just like fast. I know, I'm like, hello, we could be in opposite cities. Yeah, exactly. I'm in London, <laughs> you're in Madrid. Who would have known? Who would have known? It's been raining all day, thunderstorms. Exactly. Is it sunny there? Yeah, it's super sunny every day. Oh, okay. So nice. So, so while we're waiting for like this, people still uh, joining us. Mm -hmm. So, um, as we know, like, I don't know, like, uh, just as like a little disclaimer to everybody, like, it seems to be that there's a lot of like connectivity issues with Instagram because everybody's going live from Nami Campbell to everybody, including me, myself, and I, everybody's going live. So, so if the video is cut off, like it was last time that I was kicked out of from my own show, please tune back in. I'm just going to resume right after if, if it's not uh, seven o'clock. UK time so we will be back let's hope that we don't have to do that okay so it's officially six o'clock uh, welcome to the episode four of Morse Ghost by Bessa and I am super excited to introduce to you an amazing uh, lady a woman uh, a powerhouse called Catherine Budria welcome to the show thanks for having me I'm, I'm super stoked uh, I've received loads and loads and loads of questions regarding your profile and and what you do because uh, this is this is definitely a treat before we dive in uh, mm -hmm. I'm gonna tell everybody who's tuned in now so you can still send more questions you see on uh, down below on the screen you see the there's a question mark box just keep on sending your uh, questions there and I will be checking all of those on the interactive part of our program towards the end well but anyhow, now I'll give the floor to you, Kat. Uh, and could you please tell us, everyone, what you do and where are you Morse coding from today? Okay, well, again, thanks so much for having me. I'm honored to be on the show. Pleasure. And um, I'm Morse coding from Madrid. And as you know, we've been um, on lockdown here for quite some time. I think, in fact, it's been since March. 16th or so, wow. 26th for sure. And um, it's definitely not a joke. I mean, I've heard various other from friends around the world and what their sort of experiences are like. And here it really is um, only to go outside for absolute necessities, grocery store, pharmacy, back home. And in fact, my husband and I were walking the other day and the police came, came, came after us. It was slippery, we were both wearing gloves. And he went to grab my hand and literally the police like zoomed up out of Miami, like a Miami Vice kind of thing. And like jumped onto the sidewalk and were like, you cannot be holding your hand. You have to be apart. And he said, well, we're married. And I was just helping her. She could slip. And he's like, where are you going? And we got very much interrogated. And it's very much clear. Like you go to the Mercado and you come right home. And yeah. they're really, um, they're really cracking down. And I hope that that's why we're seeing a little bit of a change in the numbers. And, um, because it's been it's been really scary to sort of feel well. If I go outside, is it in the air? Am I gonna catch it just breathing? Um, and so we're taking it very seriously. And um, everyone in Madrid, from the food industry, has been incredible and in having constant fresh produce ready and delivered to our door. So we're good. I mean, we keep ourselves. My husband's a filmmaker, so um, he's also very creative and so we spend our days you know doing yoga reading talking about projects um, researching so it's been um, 
a really interesting time. Really, um, yeah, a nice. Uh, and we've tried to make it as best as it can be. Let's put it that way. But very much looking forward to Madrid opening up again and becoming um, the sort of convivial place that it is. And so let's hope that's soon. That's amazing. So. Uh, rather than asking you, like, how did we meet? Because actually, we have never met in person. True. But but I want to tell everybody that uh, Catherine is one of the the key members of like the people who knew about the show before it even started. It was like this sort of like cosmic cosmic way that we were uh, uh, put together, and I'm sure that the story the story will unfold by itself later as we as we go on with the project. But I'm super excited to. Uh, have you here because this lady is one of the reasons why I'm sitting here today Aww. talking to you guys. Uh, and there's a lot of other, other key key members of the small name group. Uh, anyways, um, you, uh, as far as I'm concerned, you actually were planning to go back to New York where you're based, correct? Or are you based in uh, also in Madrid and other cities apart well from I'm I'm from New York. My husband's British, and um, we're currently here for some a project that he's working on. But obviously, when this all happened, it sort of was so fast. I mean, we sat in a restaurant and literally told the the maitre d, "Oh, we want to come back next next week because it was such a nice time." And he said, "No, no, no! It's closing tonight. We're closing for two weeks. Like the city's going on shutdown." And we were like, "What?" So there really was a that was the one thing that was a bit complicated was there's real lack of communication as to sort of what the rules were supposed to be and how this was going to go. And we just decided um, at that point to you know to go back to New York. I've heard that they were quarantining people and what, what that would be like. Maybe as my husband's British and I'm American, they'd say, "Well, you could go back to." and you can go back to the U.S. I mean, I've heard all sorts of scenarios and we just said, okay, you know what? We're just going to hunker down here in our apartment and see how this goes. But um, no, in some ways that's been sort of difficult because my my whole family is in the United States and I'm not quite sure when I can go back there or when they can come here to, to visit. And um, that's just the reality. So it's yeah. luckily with the technology today, FaceTime and um, and all that makes us, you know, closer than if this had happened prior to all this technology. But at the same time, it's difficult because I think it's creating a lot of anxiety in people not knowing, you know, as I said, when can we fly to see a loved one? When, you know, when is that a possibility? So it should be interesting to see um, how this sort of unfolds, definitely. Yeah, and uh, and as and I'm sure that everybody who's following the situation is like the... Uh, the situation in New York and the death the death rates are like oh staggering very crazy high and staggering. It, just, it seems to be like completely that is you just see this sort of like uh, imagery of of like wooden like uh, um, caskets of like just people just being like you know buried in in a, you know oh, in, in on the floor. Floor. so it's just yeah. like it just feels it feels so absurd. You know, my my event. best girlfriend, my best girlfriend from Paris, who lives in New York now. She just gave birth yesterday, which is so exciting. And at the same time, I haven't had the, the, I haven't had the opportunity to meet her yet, but I can imagine what that must have been like going to the hospital in such a, it, you know at such a time. So I'm curious to hear how that all went. But luckily, she and the baby are safe, and and they've changed the law. At one point, you weren't supposed to, you weren't allowed to have a spouse or loved one in the room with you. And luckily, that was overturned because that was something she was very concerned about having her husband with her. So, but I mean, just a crazy time in New York. It seems, um, I think that Governor Cuomo is doing an amazing job at sort of informing people and and, and trying to get. Uh, everyone what they need, but it's, I think it's just overwhelming. I think that's what's the situation right now there. Yeah, because here, here obviously like, uh, um, our like the sort of death rate here and, and the people infected is, is still on the rise. It's, it keeps on going like from one day to another, it's a bit better, but we're, we're still like closer to thousand per day on an average of people who die. And, and we still haven't seen the peak of it. And the latest information is that we're going to be on lockdown at least three more weeks for sure, which wow. probably is going to extend further if, if necessary. So if we go 
then from the other element of this whole COVID-19 affecting mm-hmm. our lives, how has that affected your your business? You are, uh, as the trailer says, that you you are a key person in philanthropy, but you're also a creative director, uh, creative director of Maison Boudria. Yes. That is well, actually, company. that's a very good question because one of the things um, with being in Europe is because I work with artisans. That's that's sort of the ethos of Maison Boudria. And it was born in an idea that I wanted to have artisanal, I, I love and appreciate the artisanal work you can find when I was traveling in Morocco a couple years ago with my husband. And from there created a line and um, was was very lucky to have it so well received both in Europe and in the United States. And in coming back to Europe now, because we then were looking at New York and now back here, I really wanted to focus my, um, my new collection on Spain, which I've been started to do, and also artisans in France who I've worked with before. Um, but in a way, it's the creativity has shifted where I'm curious to still work with them and, and go out, and, but at the same time, it's been more of this survival feeling. So, so that's kind of stifled, to be honest, a little bit of my general creativity of like, okay, I have an idea for a dress or I have an idea for um, a jumper, an accessory. I just, right now it's more, do we have everything we need for today? And what do we need for tomorrow? Because who knows, right? And, um, but at the same time, I'm looking forward to, um, going, you know, diving back into this and, and sort of getting those juices creative flying again so that I can, I can continue with it with a new collection. But I think that it's also going to be interesting to see how this shifts with, um, I think we talked about this a little bit about with retail, how um, how that might shift everyone's perception and, and perception of it. Whereas before it was very much this fast fashion, I'm going to go and buy a t-shirt for 10 euros and yeah. if it rips tomorrow, we'll find, I'll go buy another one. And I've always been more of the type that I love sort of vintage pieces that I've um, collected or you know, a very fine piece that's been handcrafted to me, whether it's an artisanal basket I bought in Mexico or, um, you know, a, a piece of, of, of couture in, in, in Europe, it has a special feeling to me. It has a history. It's made by by hand. You treasure that. You keep it um, for generations in some cases. You know, that's you hear these stories of people who get their grandmother's handkerchief, you know, and yeah. I'm charmed to that. I love that, you know, and I think that maybe it was just going too fast and too disposable and that's where this has given everybody a real pause to sort of sit and think is that i mean you sort of find yourself wearing a lot of the same thing in these days because we're not out and about and then you realize how much do i actually need and you know what i really do treasure that one blouse i'm gonna wear it again because you know i don't need to go out and buy a brand new one because it's not going anywhere. Yeah, and you no, don't want to keep on washing more and more clothes. Because yeah, I, I exactly. don't want to go to the supermarket to buy detergent. Totally. <laughs> That's the other thing. I'm like, oh no, I don't need to wash anymore. No, totally, totally. So I think it's changed. Um, you know, I was never what I've created with Mesa Butcher has never been fast fashion. It was something that I wanted um, and had the pleasure of, you know, grandmothers to their grandchildren to their daughters in between buying um, from the, the various seasons and I love that so I would imagine that it's something that you keep and wear again and again and so um, I personally hope that the shift goes back to that a bit because I think it's been not only harmful for the environment but also sort of unnecessary and and, and again in terms of keeping up with trends and all this when I was younger that was something where you really had I think a season a real period of which there was a trend and now I mean before it's you can even mention it it's over so yeah. where are we going with that right and I think that that might also stifle real creativity amongst um, designers because how can you how can you have such um, natural organic creativity constantly you know it's it's sort of impossible okay. and it's, it's it's impossible and I believe that that now like you mentioned that when when things become so disposable and like how the, the, the fast fashion became is all of like it's all about excess and fast I believe that also like in the process us people we became became a bit like you know 
disposable. That oh, you absolutely. Think, like the designers and the companies and the whole process, like you actually forgot about the person who produces those clothes, that those became completely like an X mark that nobody even thinks about. So that in, in that sort of sense, like I really applaud you by focusing your business on the, the special uh, craftsmanship that the people that you employ can produce for your for your company and I believe that's going to be a massive trend and that's also going to be the sort of saving grace for the fashion industry to help the people who are struggling now that have, have been forced uh, to lock inside their houses not go to work and you know sort of like as responsible if you can help then why why wouldn't you and I think that is definitely the way forward and that's also going to be the bridge on my next question uh, since uh, since you are known for philanthropy, mm -hmm. can you can you tell me not just in the obvious way like I can see the link the, the how you run your fashion business. So, but what does philanthropy mean to you? Because for for a lot of people, philanthropy is a, a big question mark. But a lot of people don't really understand what that even entails. True. Well, I think that there's, it's, it's interesting because with this talk, I've had more time to reflect on it. And for me, it's always been, maybe also being American, it's very much this caring and helping each other. And not that that doesn't happen in other cultures, but I mean, for instance, in high school, you're already told, you know, you have to do a certain amount of community service hours, you have to volunteer, it's, it's part of your education to, um, it's not money driven when you're in, at that level at all it's it's your time and and um i think that that's been very much instilled with me by my parents but also by my education and um i think that this is something that has stayed with me so what's what was interesting is that you know charity is something that uh you know relieves that maybe a social problem in pain but philanthropy really being um, finding the root, finding the source of where this pain is coming from in, in our social environment and really trying to find a way um, to, to solve that problem and to, to aid those in need. And so um, in, in various situations, various organizations I've been a part of, it's, I've been driven by um, something that's spoken to me. So, you know, at one point I was, when I was living in Paris, I was with the, a lot of my doctors were at the American Hospital of Paris and I realized that they needed some fundraising. And so when I moved back to New York, I helped start a committee and generated awareness, but, and, and through events, we helped raise some money that all went back to that hospital. And, um, you know, it, I think that that's very important because I think that at this point, the private sector needs to help to get involved, um, in all shapes and sizes, because it, it can't be just reliant on the state anymore. And, and that's proven, I think, even now with this crisis, you've seen amazing uh, reaction from companies in France, in Spain, um, in Italy that normally were, you know, like um, Louis Vuitton, you know, making the gel for the hands and the masks and all this. I mean, this was an amazing um, effort to, to, to pull together because it just, it's this, it's very necessary in today's world. That's that's my feeling. But I think for um, the recent project that I did with uh, with our family foundation with Real Madrid with with child, with helping children, I think that that is something that there's a, there was the issue that we saw was that there was a lack of funding in the, in certain public schools, and there's a lot of um, children coming from around the world. Their parents just arrived there's lack of um, English training. And so this is the, this was a problem I kept seeing reoccurring again and again in many communities. And that was something I wished to, again, what's the root of the problem? Well, the root of the problem is the school just couldn't have all this after school funding, uh, after school programs, they didn't have the funding. So that's where um, I'm developing this program where now children are having after school tutoring in English and also uh, sports availability. This is something that I found um, really rewarding of, of a project to put together because I just, I, I think it's so, to me it was something that was, I saw their, their faces when they, when this was announced and all these children lit up and it was something to me that was 
really beautiful. So I think that that's also the thing with philanthropy. It's not for personal gain at all. It's, it's for something that you do naturally and purely for um, for the for the for the benefit of others, for the benefit of, of yeah. humankind. You know. Yeah. So it's more like like how I see it for me being a European and especially like Finnish. So like I've like I've mentioned earlier on the the, the previous episodes, it's like like the, the way that I was brought up was completely different like we don't have that type of structure plus we don't even have that many people so it's <laughs> you know in, in the sort of sense it's like yeah. uh, everything is in such a like mini, miniature scale that right. you know we, we, we don't really struggle with uh, you know educational problems or homeless um, issues or anything like this just because as a communities we are built and can actually maintain the sort of sort of like uh, misbalance but it's, it's so lovely to hear from a american because because to me i always thought about like I, there was always a massive question mark in regards like what that actually means because it does not exist in in my culture don't really know if it like i'm sure they exist in in, in a british one but but it's like i'm completely completely disconnected but i can definitely connect with the fact that it's more like a lifestyle that you want to help maybe yeah. this is my form of philanthropy <laughs> because <laughs> i am i'm totally broke and i'm like i can only operate at the moment from my little studio apartment but i'll, I'll I'm, i'm doing my best um but, but that's i think the point is that i think that there's a lot of mis understandings that people think it's all money driven and actually yeah. it, it's time too you know i mean if there's if volunteering in any capacity um to hospitals i mean right now might be tricky because they don't want all that but i mean just on it for instance candy striping or going to an old people's home and 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 playing chess and reading books with them because they're lonesome this is a way that i see um a different sort of philanthropy that is it's really time driven it's what you can dedicate to others right yeah, and i think that definitely. um yeah i think it could be cultural i think and in, in maybe in the yeah and i read a little bit more and, and did realize that the first sort of definition of philanthropy began in the uk began in london with with children that were um sort of orphaned on the street and there was an organization of people that decided that that shouldn't be. So they've started to build these um, children's homes and, and sort of try to uh, cultivate their studies. And, and from there it sort of grew. And then from that it um, made its way across the pond to the US. But I think it's, yeah, it's very much in our DNA. And that's why when you go to museums in the United States or go to certain universities or you go to hospitals, you see people's name on the board or you see The, um, a corporation that you know this wing was was given by this garden was donated by because they, otherwise I mean it wouldn't be there so I think that there's um, it, it's all for it's all for a good thing it's all positive yeah because because I think I that's really interesting for me to hear that because that's the first time I hear hear about it and I've also many times like because you see the sort of like slates on a building and then you just always think of it like but why Or like, because because nowadays we our in um, environment in our culture is so driven about with about ego, mm. because there's there's a lot of like when it comes to like politics and all of this, there's always sort of sketchy business, somewhat like attached to for someone pretending to do good. So I think it's it's a very nice uh, explanation that you just gave what it is for for people to understand that those are two completely different things i mean i'm sure know. that that does exist right but i of think of course that, everything it, exists yeah but i think from at least from my perspective and like maybe i'm naive but i look at, I look at it yeah, me too. <laughs> the pure side and that's because that's always what's driven me because i've had people ask me like why why are you doing that like you know you could be doing something else with your time kind of thing and yeah I, and I think it's because it speaks to me whatever it is because i've been i've come across it and i'm like i can do something i can help somehow And um, so that's sort of where that, that drive comes from. Yeah, because I don't know if it's like, for me, right, just starting this project, it was just like the feeling that I can't just sit still. Mm. That even though how uncomfortable I would be with the idea of sitting in front of a camera, talking to a person, 
I still, it was like the feeling, I was like, I need to do this. Like, I will not forgive myself if I don't do this because I see the people around me, my closer circles, like, you know, my own mom and everybody to see the, the effects in different levels, what this type of like lockdown and being quarantined in a, in a confined space and not being able to do things. Totally. Actually, that's to a person. You know, I, it's the same thing I have on, I have days that I, I, I really, I'm not feeling it. And I'm just kind of like, what the hell is going to happen? And then the other days I'm like, yeah, we can do this. And you know, this is also a way for me to kind of keep, keep going and just like not think about the negative all the time. Totally. Totally. And so, I've, I've had some discussions recently with some friends to try to put together maybe an, um, an event, sort of a virtual event to uh, help artists during this time, because I think that so many events, so many, um, you know, concerts and galleries and all these things at the moment are been halted and we don't know for how much longer it's that going to be the case. And so that's something I'm, we're sort of playing around with now. How, how, can we, how can we do something again? Because again, as you say, I'm sort of sitting here with our feet kind of still being like, okay, what can we do? Because otherwise, you know, you can, do, you can do plenty. It's just like, it would be different if we would be now in 91 with, yeah. with our smartphones. Then I would say we would be pretty much like, okay, every man and woman for themselves. But, yeah. but now we actually do have the information. It's just about like activating ourselves, finding innovative ways to do things. <laughs> so so from, from that statement, has, has this now, like this lockdown, has it really stopped for uh, you to uh, do your fashion business or your philanthropy? Or are you still able to, you know, still work towards, you know, as an well, are you I, in like, But like I just mes mentioned, I'm sort of um, was inspired to kind of do something a little different now and sort of see what we can do with, as I said, with artists yeah. during this time. And that be sort of like to organize this fun virtual event that's sort of where my, my mind is there because, um, you know, in, in, in organizing these things generally, they're a lot of fun, obviously, but it's also like, okay, we've got to get the a know, lot of campaign. Work. That's a lot of work. <laughs> and the florist. A this lot of work. Thing. And having it just be all virtual and you get to like push a button and like all of a sudden there's like roses in the room, that would be awesome. So, yeah. Hey, yeah. But, so that's sort of, that's where I'm kind of inspired to do something right now. Um, but in terms of, like I said, with, with business, it sort of put it all at the halt. I mean, I certainly can't go traveling around Morocco right now, nor yes. even even Spain. I mean, I can't leave Madrid. They would, it's not allowed. So I'm sort of, I'm spending a lot of time researching, kind of figuring out, as I said, um, you know, this and that, but I get this and that new collection, Who's who can kind of, that's something I've tried to source who does what in Europe, because I think that that's also becoming as it is. I had, I'll tell you a story. So when I had my collection once presented in a shop in New York, I was told by the buyers, well, can't we just order another thousand units from your factory? And I looked at them, I said, no, 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 I don't think you understand. This is actually made by people. Like I've met them by with their hands. Like they sit and sew. And when they're done, they hand it to another person who does the special sewing of this embroidery and to another person who does this. It's, it takes weeks, you know? And so that's why I can do X amount, but this is not fast fashion that's going to yeah. be produced in thousands of units and then put on a sale rack somewhere. It'll never go on sale. It has a, a real um, heart and soul behind it and a, and a story and a history. And um, otherwise I don't, I don't want to do it. And yeah. So in terms of, um, so to get back to it, so what I've been doing is, is sourcing, trying to figure out who is producing what or where I can kind of find this or that, right? So I was very excited that before all this occurred, I discovered an amazing town, like two hours from Madrid, where they produce lace. And it is the most inspiring thing to see because you see the grandmothers and the little girls and their, at this school, teaching them how to make lace by hand and I just fell in love. I thought this is so amazing. This is what we have to keep alive. It's jobs, it's trade, yeah. it's 
it's creative it's it's well made because it's made by hand it's not going to be um sort of fastly quickly stitched and then fall apart which i've experienced before yes. so um that's very exciting so i think i have my lace maker which is great but i have to now look for some more cloth and fabric materials so that's something that i'm doing virtually at the moment but it's a little different than the fun of it is to go and to feel and to, to meet them and kind of from that i get very inspired and so this is something i'm like yearning to do so um planning a little bit if we can this summer to go to france if we're allowed and um to greece and i'm like, very excited to see who i can kind of you know you will, find, you will find amazing people like both in, in spain and in greece i visited yeah. greece for the first time last year and i was blown away just by the, the people and, and, and the talent that is there. Mm. But obviously, obviously it's just everything has been so overlooked because, you know, yes. because you can't get it straight away or you can't get it cheap or whatnot. So I, I'm so um, inspired and intrigued about this, even to apply that in towards my work after this is done and just focus on showcasing pieces like that. Because it, it really reminds me of when I was like, what, seven years old and going to you know, like my first years in school, because in Finland we had to do, everybody had to do mandatory, you know, sewing lessons. Wow. The boys had to do sewing lessons, then they can choose if they want to continue with that sort of stuff. Or, and the same thing, girls had to go and do woodwork. So we had to do this type of, you know, you know, very old school trade. And, and I just remember, it's like, ah, oh, what, the only thing what we had to do is PJs for ourselves. But that's what, how I learned how to sew, even though I don't sew actively and I completely like forgot about the, the whole process. But that just reminded me of that. And I think it's a it's a it's a good lesson to have. I think you all of these sort of like core core things. Like, you know, if, if this happened, how how what the hell do we not know that there can be like a loss of whole electricity? And okay. like a pulse, and what? What? Well, I know how to, <laughs> how to make fire without putting down matches. So. Boy, it's, it's true. Well. Everything from like you no know, little things, but like washing or sewing or cooking. I yeah. mean, I love to cook. It's one of my passions. But now I think it's been thirty-three nights in a row or something crazy, and I'm like, <laughs> ah, I'm going nuts. But I would rather, but so it's, yeah, it's, it's definitely rediscovering all of these, these, uh, yeah. fun little things. But I think, as you say, it's this focus that's very, um, it's this focus that's, that's come into play in some, in, in a different way, right? That you're sort of, um, as things have stopped and calmed down and, and, and time has almost stopped that you have these moments to sort of, yeah, focus in another direction. So yeah, I think it'll be. I just, I just I just hope that we all like even though where everybody's dying to uh, get out and do things, but I I really really hope that people will not forget this time in the sort of sense that also take, take some of the things with them that they forgot that they had mm -hmm. and the skills and you know it's it's fine that you don't have to be always available you don't have to do certain things just do what feels good for you and you know like if you need to take the time for you know master that pancake recipe like i have done <laughs> <laughs> then you have to do it you know how how ever mary Poppins or martha stewart that would make you look like but it's 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 fine no absolutely i think that's definitely um what i hope to as well because i think even though this has been very challenging for everybody the same time as you say, I think so many people are sharing cooking uh, lesson or recipes all of a sudden, and people are taking the time to do that and enjoying it. It seems from everybody's Instagram feed that they're having this time with their family and um, and, and doing things for each other and taking, as the French would say, like petit plaisir, you know, like taking this time to have these like small pleasures and not just rushing, 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 and like sort of at, at some point. People are saying they're getting more done now than before because it was always like rush, 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 rush. And then actually at the end, they didn't really get a lot accomplished. For now, they're really um, taking that time to 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 do it properly, you know? Yeah. So. But for me, it's been crazy because since starting this project, I have had no pauses. I was like, I was like, <laughs> I was over, over Easter. I was like, I'm wondering if I could take, take one day off. 
Non-stop like editing. Somebody's calling me. I'm like, I can't talk to you. I don't have time. I don't do this. But it's like, you know, every every man and woman for themselves. Um, well, if we go back to a little bit of more like the tedious side of uh, of the business, um, have you have you had, like you mentioned a couple like that you you've noticed a couple of companies that have done like great efforts in uh, in the form of philanthropy. But has there has there been any a specific one that you've noticed now during this time that would have done something that is uh, on an innovative basis? Not just that the sort of, you know, like, oh, here's a million, just because everybody everybody's doing it, we must do it as well. Have you seen any of these sort of bigger companies that, that really have gone forward in that sort of like wow way. Well, I think yeah, I mean I think it was yesterday or so that Hermes released a press release that um, that they were keeping all of their fifteen thousand five hundred employees worldwide intact. That they were donating twenty million euros to the Hôpital de Paris, to various hospitals there. Um, that they were also donating um, liquid uh, sanitizer. They're changing the factories to to make this you know Purell and. Um, and just how they were sort of, they were going to cut back on any sort of raises for executives during this year and thereby keeping all their employees and i think that that um, all of the and, and well is making masks which i was sort of thinking are they going to make the scarves into masks or how are they going to do this but i think it's but all jokes aside i think it's tremendous that on many different levels that they openly announced what they are doing and i don't know I doubt it's just for PR. I think it's also because they wanted to show this collective, um, uh, how do I say? Um, Transparency, maybe? Yeah, and collective community at, at all these different levels, right? So the hospitals, their employees, uh, sort of the, 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 the lack of the sanitizer and the masks and, and all of it together to show that they really as a company were behind this as much as they could. Uh, secondly to that being LVMH, I think they've also done a considerable lot to sort of, um, you know, get get their company to uh, to give back in, in, in measures as, as, as much as they could. But I think that um, the one thing I haven't really appreciated is that I've, I've gotten a lot of emails from companies about, you know, sales and I realize they need to do that to stay afloat. But I mean, even like some really big major ones and I'm thinking, I'm not really interested in buying like new jeans right now. Yeah. Like, I don't yeah. need your like 20% off code. Like, thanks. You know what I mean? Yeah, it no. just seems like, I don't know. I, it just seems kind of inappropriate. And I wish, because it's not just one. I've been getting them every Same. day. Same. And I'm like. <laughs> Same. And it's like, it's, it's almost like Monday is 50% off. By Friday is 75. And it was kind of like. Exactly. Like the, the desperation is. is it's a perfume that you don't like. I mean, it's the center. But, but, to, like, but to be honest, like I don't even like. For me, the most disturbing part is not even that that uh, the companies are going to uh, trying to stay afloat. For me, the problem is that there has to be somebody who has to process all of these orders, and that person has to be there, precisely, precisely. Uh, putting themselves at risk just to pay pay his or her bills. Just then, because. it's the postman or the DHL guy that has to deliver it. Or for yes. instance, I'm getting stuff from all over, right? So companies in London, New York, uh, California, whatever, right? And I'm thinking to myself, uh, well, are you, can you are you going to ship it into the customs here? And that person like has to come to work be potentially like it just seems that's negating the whole purpose of this lockdown. It's like we're all yeah. just supposed to sort of sit home together quietly. <laughs> like, we don't need to have all this cross. I mean, I think at the same time, Amazon made a statement that they're delivering in the U.S. I think like only necessary sort of expending expending postage but i think that for the time being that's that's okay you know if everyone's not shopping up a storm online like we it's, as i said it's more this like survival mode and you know ordering uh nappies for your children or paper towels or whatever you need something you really need is far more important that it gets to the right person than like me getting a new pair of jeans that i'm gonna wear around the house anyway and that's sort of yeah. where I, my head yeah. is right now with this yeah and like I said, it's not just, it's just, it's a little bothering because I'm, as I said, 
you know, who's packing it, where, who's shipping it, who's picking it up, and all this, it just doesn't seem necessary right now. So I think that, and again, it's so many emails on a daily basis that I'm, it's a little bit overwhelming. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, I'm gonna put you all in my junk box if you keep sending me emails. But um, otherwise though, I think, as I said, some of these bigger companies like in Spain, um, Inditex, um, you know, had a major shipment of masks delivered here in Spain, which I thought was amazing. So, uh, yeah, I haven't been following all of that, but the ones I have that have popped up on my news feed, I thought that's well done, you know? Yeah, because I think I think the, the, the tricky part here is like why I think a lot of people have got, gotten like very confused because, you know, there are the companies that, you know, these big, big multi-million companies that they can pull off like this type of like great effort of certain things, but then on the same note, they refuse to pay for for their workers if if they're forced to stay at home. Mm -hmm. So there's like a lot of this like some of the companies they have like so so many like some like yin and yang that it doesn't match together. Mm -hmm. So I, I believe for someone like me who's not so informed about com complete infrastructure, what is going on. So that can be a very confusing and you know sometimes to me it can come across like oh okay so you are trying to buy buy your way out of this. Mm -hmm. Because you're doing this, but then on the same note, you are mistreating your employees in the midst of it. If you know what yeah. I mean. Yeah, right? no, totally. It seems sort of contradictory, right? Yeah. So. so, but but I mean, it's like, I guess you have to think about like, you know, you have a company you, that employs millions and millions of people. There's sub managers, sub people, different countries. It's not just one person who can even operate it anymore on the sort of like 100% like I have reins on my hands. Well, you know what's interesting is that that segues into another topic is this idea of globalization. So um, where is that gonna look, what is that gonna look like? And I spoke about it with my husband, I spoke about my brother today, like I went, when I went to Georgetown and my, one of my first classes there was about globalization and that was a few mo moons ago as we say now, but that was, from what that looked like and what it looks like now, and I'm wondering, what is this? Is this sort of a a wake up call to how that has to sort of change a little bit? Like that maybe everything shouldn't be available all over the place all the time. I don't know. I mean, for me, it was used to be something that was amazing to walk into a certain store in France or Italy or wherever I was, and and realize I can only get this here. Like I, yeah. it's a very yeah. special journey to come here, find it as it's like a treasure hunt, perhaps, right? Stumble upon it, fall in love with it, and bring it home. And it, and all of that is part of the story, right? Of Whereas course. Now is it's just, as I said, in some ways I like it, and in other ways I'm a little bit, I'm a bit torn. But maybe, as you just said, if there's a company with millions of employees and they're all spread around the world, I mean, it's very difficult to a keep up that level, right? Um, and, and to keep sort of an eye on it, on everything. I yeah, mean, because corruption is everywhere. You know, like you can have a person who wants to do well, and then you hire a person who is stealing from you, and you don't even know that. You know, it's like, it can be from the smallest sort of, you know, scale to a massive scale. That is, is it's completely, that's that's what happens in sort of corporate work, because it becomes so big, Yes. I think that you have to then introduce like several CEOs from external sources to kind of maintain the whole, whole, whole lot. Yeah. <laughs> enough, no, enough about that. Um, what do you think is going to be the, the positive silver lining of all of this craziness and madness that is going on? I truly hope that, that the positive silver lining is that people take more time to do what they what they want to do or what they love to do, which is what I think I've seen um, uh, through friends and and you know what I've seen more on Instagram of of people that are taking time to paint, as we said, or cook or write or come up with a, a new project such as this that you've developed, you know, and and um, I, I really hope that that's one aspect. Another aspect is taking more time to realize what their what's going into their bodies what the, what's in their food how they're preparing it that it matters because and, and one's personal health I guess right that 
you know, exercise, fresh food, uh, when it can, you can have it. Um, all of this has become, I, well, for me, it's very important and has been for years, but I think that, uh, I would hope that that's become more of a message for people, um, as, as this has really become such a health crisis that is affecting anybody, everybody at every age and every, you know, race, color, and creed. Like, it's just, no one's kind of spared. And, and so I, I wonder if that's maybe had an effect on how people are um, viewing this um, going forward, right? Because um, it has this time to reflect. That's what we've had, right? And um, I hope that it, I read an article in the FT the other day that said, uh, the arts are never as important. And we, ne we, we don't need the arts as much as in, ever as we do now, right? Something that affected me. And it really struck me because you're seeing amazing museums that have virtual uh, viewings now. And, um, you know, Versailles opened up their, their virtual spaces and you can go through the gardens and this and that. And uh, the Met is doing this and various, various museums and operas are going online and virtually, you know, sharing their, their um, operettas and ballet and and there's a reason for that. I think that that's because there's more of an audience for it now. And, and, and entertainment. The, the, yeah. the fact that, that because the, the person who thinks that art is complete nonsense should rethink every single time they open their Netflix subscription because Absolutely. it's the creatives who produce the content that you're watching. Absolutely. And what would we do without them? Right, and and what would we do without the artists that came before us? They created all these amazing works of art. They'll inspire us all the time. But I, so I hope that there's. I guess that's that's that would be my point. I hope that there's this real strong, renewed love, appreciation, and respect for the arts. Because I mean, what would we do without it? Especially now. I mean, people are being, as you say, entertained like more than ever before. Whether it's Netflix or as I said, it's virtual things or. And that's that's so true. That's an amazing silver lining, if that's the case. Apologies, I'm like completely now submerged to the evening sun, but <laughs> it is the time <laughs> time uh, to uh, jump onto our interactive uh, uh, section. Last 15 minutes, I have questions from the audience. Okay. Very so good. let's have a look. I'm trying to like change the light in here, just a second. Okay. So, uh, Kate, how, yeah. did, how do you start a career in alt altruism or philanthropy? Um, I think that that's then that's very much a question for. But I think from what I said earlier is that it can start from a very early age, and any background or it's nothing to do with money i think it's knocking on the door of, of a cause per se that's that's of interest to you and saying i want to learn more about this how can i get involved i'd like to donate my time a couple hours a week or what have you and i think that from there it can sort of morph into something um bigger and a full-on career i mean if otherwise there's if you do some research on a particular topic chances are you'll stumble upon a um a a foundation or a, a corporate foundation that is funding something in that area in which you can again knock on the door say I want to get involved and that is nothing to do with money it is everything to do with your time and your 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 arts and crafts that you can bring to the to the story right so I think that that and I, as I said I think from there it can morph into something bigger if you really are that passionate about it yeah so, Right, I totally agree with you that because I, I believe like in, in anything, any good doing, it, it just comes from the heart at first, uh -huh. and then and then you start building just the way that you build your house throughout the years. You get more, you know, more skills, more equipment. You know, you broaden your horizons, and then also the scale becomes bigger. That's how it kind of seems like it's even like how you build your career. Uh, so on to the next question: Is mm -hmm. creating is creating awareness philanthropy in your opinion? I do think so. I mean, again, when we discuss like what the actual term of or definition of philanthropy is being, you know, wanting to an attempt to address the root of a problem in society, right? 
So I think that drawing awareness to the problem and knowing and understanding the root of it is absolutely um, what it's all about. You know, and, and, and bringing awareness, bringing to light the story that people might say, oh, well, I mean, again, as we talk about, everyone is so busy with their lives. But if you can be out there and say, listen, there's this issue that's really disturbing me that I've read all about that I think we should do something about. Um, you know, at, at present, one of the things that that's been disturbing me in the news is all this um, discussion of spousal abuse that's been going on through these lockdowns. And that's something that um, I've already started a little bit of research on to identify um, various uh, organizations that are, that, are, that are behind this to try to see what can be done. Is that another fundraising effort to do because they can't go to shelters because of COVID and um, that normally they would maybe do. And I know in some countries they have like a, a code that if a woman's being abused, she can go to a pharmacy and ask for a mask. I think in France it's like mask neuf or something. And then it's a code that they're being abused and the pharmacist is then supposed to take it from there. But I mean, how horrible. And that's really something that's come out, the root of that being that people are stuck together maybe more than ever. And there's all this stress and there's all this anxiety and there's no excuse for this, but I'm just saying for, it's a perfect storm that then it's created this horrible um, results, right? You have all these people yeah. being abused and I, I think that that's so troubling and that's, so that's why I said, I think that it's something that you have to sort of find, stumble upon and, and as, as a problem and then say, okay, I want to address this. I want to talk about it. I want to build awareness. Yeah. And, Totally, to like I totally agree, and I, I I believe like because you know to share some some something personal from from my childhood, like my my father was extremely violent, and I, I and I spent like uh, you know my childhood in safety houses like when I was five years old, wow. you know, but 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 obviously you know been through that and completely openly uh, discussed that with 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 my own mother. You know, I'm completely fine with that. But I remember that a lot of people they they would not just understand that. They just are like, "Oh my God, I'm so sorry." It's so dramatic and and stuff like this. So I believe that maybe this this whole outbreak that has happened is, is forcing people to open their eyes of the things that is happening that usually yes. you would just completely just ignore because you can. Mm -hmm. Now you cannot. Yeah. So so in that sort of sense. I think it's it's very very important, and I, I think it's also very important for for the people who are suffering from the abuse, for them to also understand that you know it's not okay, because many of these cases, when it's the sort of abuser and the, the one who's been abused, is not always that the one who is abusing is making the other one to stay. Many times, it's also the other one that the one who is getting abused just stays in the situation mm. and and i i know this from for for a personal experience by seeing that happen in my own childhood so it's nothing is never so simple right. so so i'm i'm totally totally off if you're gonna do something about that i'm in oh that'd be great i, I, I have so many crazy stories maybe i'll unveil un un some of that uh, no, I think that that future. helps. Also, being being, a, I mean, without even knowing that, but like that's what's that you're just building awareness that is yeah. just being from personal experience and talking about it. That's that's brave, a, and 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 b to have survived it, be you know a functioning member of society, having gone through it, it someone else maybe going through that to say, guess what, I can talk about it too, or I need to talk about yeah. it, and I think that that's very important. And I mean. I actually identified something in London. I, I'm going to talk to you about that later. But I think that I think that would be, it would be wonderful to do something because I think it's, as you say, you can't ignore it now, right? It's out no. there. And no. As for instance, on a lighter note, people are talking about how the environment has improved so much. You see all these pictures of like exactly. LA, you know, kind of normal smog day, and like what it looks like now, or that we can see the Himalayas, or that there's dolphins in Venice again. I mean. Wow, right? So, because we can't ignore it, because it's just like right in front of our face, it's cleared up, you know? And so I think that there's definitely importance to speak up, and, and that is the core of bringing awareness to something. Totally, definitely. totally, totally. And, and and I think it's like with, with all of this sort of stuff and wrapping that subject is just to kind of like, for, for people to understand that, you know, horrible things happen. You know, even like this, the, the whole COVID-19 thing is happening, or, you know, 
this is the world that we live in. Bad things happen to people. You don't have to feel ashamed about it. It's yes. not, you don't have to feel that you're stigmatized or you're damaged goods. You know, like you can come out of it and you can be sane and you, you, you know, you have a life. Oh it's yeah. About, it's just about like realizing that and, you know, forgiving yourself and forgiving whoever mistreated you wrong and just keep it moving, you know and not harness that sort of negative energy towards anything, and you're going to be fine. It's, I'm not saying it's easy. <laughs> that I'm not saying. <laughs> you're like, don't get me wrong, it's not easy. It's not, it's, it's not easy. Okay, we have still seven minutes, okay. so I still have uh, one question here. Uh, okay. Um, there's like um, a clothing company, I assume, has asked you, we have one collection that we add to every season. Do you see other companies doing the same now in the future? In terms of then having um, this sort of more sustainable, as opposed to multiple collections, just adding one season? No, like, no, like, do you see other companies, like bigger companies, following this example? That that I think it's the consumer. A lot, a lot of companies follow what the consumer is asking for and demands, and so I think if the consumer said, "Listen, if one collection is enough. Like, that's all I'm interested in buying." and I want it to be made right, and I'll pay a little bit more because I know that that's the one thing I'm buying for the season and add to your wardrobe and your collection and have it be, I mean, there's that, that's where that word wardrobe, it's not just, oh, I have like a million pairs of shoes and, and jeans and da da da. No, you're supposed to build stuff that you love. You, you're supposed to, sorry, I'm getting a little tired now. You're supposed to build a collection that you love. That's your wardrobe, right? And yeah. what's adding to it is because, oh, I have this amazing skirt and this blouse is going to fit it perfectly. And I've never found a blouse for this skirt, but now I just did, you know? And so if you can have a collection and add to it in your in your house and, and the company also feels that, right? So that would be a smart thing, I would think. They'd be like, oh, this is my client. This is my customer. They love our, they love our, our, our collection. I'm saying that word a lot. Um, <laughs> Therefore, we know we made this last year. That will go with this this year, right? Thinking that they're keeping it, that they're not just throwing it away. And so let me get a new one, right? Perfect. I mean, yeah, certain pieces in your wardrobe you want to refresh, absolutely. But I mean, some of the, I mean, I some pieces I have like Tom Ford from you know his days at Gucci or uh, vintage Balenciaga. I mean, I would I would be run over in traffic before I gave that up. Do yeah, it's, exactly. that, it's like yeah. so precious to me, and that's why I mean, I think if they, if they see if they stick with the season and one season only, that would be a smart, um, smart thing to do. Smart I, thing to do. I, I totally agree with you, and it's more about just like finding your personal style. Like, how many black little dresses one need, or how many I've had the same winter coat for the past seven years, and I'm yeah. gonna cry crocodile tears when that falls, literally deteriorates from my back, <laughs> and then it's the time to find a replacement. I have. One more uh, question before we go to the famous speed round of questions. We have uh, four minutes, so try to keep this Here we go. Uh, great. So, um, I actually have one one minute and 53 seconds. Okay, so we have to uh, go uh, real quick to the speed round. So, pizza or pasta? Um, pasta. Gluten free uh, pizza, maybe, but mm, pasta. Yeah. Uh, stilettos or uh, platforms? Stilettos. Uh, trousers or a skirt? Skirt. Rebel or conformist? Mm, individualist. Fair. <laughs> <laughs> uh, red or white wine? Uh, white. Yeah. Uh, green or yellow? Yellow. Cinema or Netflix? Both. Uh, homemade meal or restaurant? Both depending on the meal. <laughs> I like to cook anything and everything, but certain things I know I can't, and therefore I love to go to a restaurant. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, drama or comedy? Comedy. Uh, clueless or mean girls? Clueless, 100%. Spring or fall? Fall. I'm a fall baby. Uh, day or night? Mm, used to be night, but now I, I quite like the days. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> That was it. Oh, there's so much we fun. We literally have like 35 seconds before this video is cut off. So it's we've amazing. been very so affectionate. Fun. Apologies to everybody whose uh, questions we can answer just because of the time restraint. 
I thank you so much, Kate. I thank this you. Is an absolute pleasure. So, so, much. so if you missed, you saw just a little bit of this. This will be available in YouTube very soon, so you will get to revisit our conversations. Fun. In Morse code with uh, Bessheim Kate. I I wish you the have nice evening. Stay safe. You too. Happy loads and talk to you soon. Bye.